wouldn't it be amazing to have a way of dealing with the unstable gradients problem in our neural networks while also making the network train a little bit faster and also maybe even dealing with the overfitting problem at the same time? Well, if you want that, you're in the right place because today we're talking about batch normalization. This video is part of the Deep Learning Explained series by Assembly AI, a company building a state-of-the-art speech-to-text API. And if you want a part of it, you can go get their free API token using the link in the description. We will first talk about how batch normalization works and how everything works under the hood. And then we will talk about some benefits of batch normalization and why we would choose to use it. And lastly, I will show you how to implement it in Python code using Keras. The first thing that I want to clarify is the definition of normalization. So you might have heard in a lot of different places that you need to normalize your input before you feed it to your neural network, or you need to standardize your input before you feed it to neural network. These terms sometimes are used interchangeably and they're not really strictly defined. So, but let's define them here just so you know what I mean when I say normalization or standardization. Normalization is collapsing the input range that you have to be between zero and one, whereas standardization is changing your value so that their mean equals to zero and their variance or standard deviation equals to one. So on like a little visual, what it would look like is let's say if we had some values that go from zero to 100, let's say they were 20, 70, and 90, after we normalize them, they're going to be between zero and one. So then they'll probably be 0 0.2, 0 0.7, and 0 0.9, still keeping the ratio that they had to each other. Whereas for standardization, if we had something similar, at the end, we're going to change these values so that when we put them in a distribution, their mean is going to be at zero and the most amount of values are going to be between minus one and one. And then as you go further in the distribution, you're going to see less and less of these values. So why do we need any sort of normalization for our neural networks to begin with? So let's take this example. Let's say we have a neural network and we want to feed data into it. Our two features are a number of phones that were ever owned by someone and the number of um, or the amount of money they have withdrawn from the ATM today. Uh, so as you can see, they have very different ranges. One of them goes from 2 to 24, and the other one goes from 0 to 1,000. So what's going to happen if you feed your network the unnormalized version of this data is that you're going to make it very hard for your network to learn the optimal weight values that minimizes the cost or the error. And in turn, you will also cause your network to have weights that are very different than each other. So the weight that we are going to multiply the number of phones with is going to be very different than the number of uh, than the weight that we're going to multiply the input that is the amount of money that was withdrawn from the bank account. So in turn, you might cause your network to also be unstable and in the end have a network that has the vanishing or the exploding gradients problem. So what we do to overcome this problem normally is that first of all of course we normalize our inputs and we also try to use the correct weight initializ initialization technique and also the correct activation function that goes with this weight initialization technique but even if you do everything correctly unstable gradients problem might come back later in the training but there is one solution that could save the day and that's batch normalization so what we do with batch normalization is instead of only normalizing our inputs and then feeding the data into our network, we normalize all the outputs of all the layers in our network. So in this diagram, you can see we have our network and in each, in between each layer, we have a batch normalization layer. So what the, it does is basically normalize our data and do a little bit more of a small trick on top of it and then feed the data or feed the output from the previous layer to the next layer. So let's see how that works. In this small example, let's say we have six data points. Uh, they go from three to 24. We have three, five, eight, nine, 11, and 24. What batch normalization does at first is to standardize them based on what we were talking in the first uh, lesson. You can call it normalization too. But what it does is to make sure that their mean is zero and their variance is one. So it recalculates them and puts them in the correct place. But after it does that, this is not uh, the end of what batch normalization does. It also scales and offsets these values by 
some amount that is going to be determined based on the training process. So as you can see here, and this is kind of like the last step, the formula from the last step of batch normalization, we have the values that have been changed already, that have been standardized. And on top of these values, we multiply them by some value, which is called the scale. And we also add another value to them, which is called the offset. These two values are basically trainable parameters. We're not going to determine them. They're not hyperparameters or anything. Uh, we're not going to determine them before the training starts. These are going to be learned like any other parameter in the network, like the weights and the biases. So what it would look like if I scale this value, these values that I have right now, if I multiply them by two, if I scale them by two, where this is going to basically be multiplying by them, them by two. And what else you can do is to offset them if you want to offset them by 0 0.5 and then it's going to look like this. It's basically going to be uh, sliding them a little bit on the axis that they're on. So this is what batch normalization does to kind of find a good transformation, a transformation that works for these data points to help the network overcome the unstable gradients problem and in turn it actually makes it train a little bit faster. Well, you might say, how does that work? There are so many extra calculations that we need to do in between the hidden layers. How do we end up having a network that trains faster. And you're right, what happens is when you're training a network that has batch normalization, the epochs take longer. Every epoch takes a bit longer than it would have if there were no batch normalization. But in the end, batch normalization helps us achieve the same accuracy that we did without having batch normalization with less epochs. So at the end, the amount of time that we add because of batch normalization is much less than the amount of time that we save because we added batch normalization. And not surprisingly, when you can train your network with fewer epochs to achieve the same accuracy that you did without batch normalization, you can of course train it a little bit more and maybe even achieve better performance. And on top of that, because this is a normalization layer, if you'd like, you do not have to separately normalize your or standardize your inputs before feeding it to your neural network, but you can just have a batch normalization layer before your first layer, and then effectively your inputs will be normalized so you can keep everything in one neat package. So that's another advantage of using batch normalization. And lastly, it was seen that batch normalization actually reduces the need for doing regularization. If you remember, regularization is something we did to deal with overfitting, but with batch normalization, you don't even have to do that anymore. But of course, you might need to try this out for your own network and then see if that's actually the case or not. But that was shown that it is actually one of the other benefits of batch normalization. So that was all that I wanted to say in terms of what how batch normalization works and the benefits of batch normalization. Now let's see how we can implement it using Keras and Python. I will show you how it works using the MNIST dataset, so really classic example of handwritten digits. Uh, here I'm just importing the libraries that I need and the dataset from Keras. Uh, and this is what the data points look like. So this is one example of data. It is a 28 to 28 image. So that means there are 784 pixels. Each of these pixels have a value. So this, va this value goes from zero to 255. And the lower the value, the darker the pixel and the higher the value, the lighter the pixel. So if you look at this example, probably this one, this dark one here is around like 200, whereas this one is probably 70 and the actual fully white ones are going to be 255. So what we want to do before we feed this data set to our network is to normalize it. One way of doing it is basically just dividing all the training values to 200 with 255. And then effectively you're going to have a network or the data set in your hand that goes to where all the values go from zero to one. And later you feed that data to your network that you created here and train it as you wish. Uh, let's look at what our network looks like. We basically have one flatten layer that takes a 28 to 28 matrix and then flattens it to be one long list of 784 values. And then we have two hidden layers, one with 300 neurons, the other with 100 neurons, and a output layer with 10 neurons. So what if I wanted to have batch normalization in here? Well, it's very simple actually. All you have to do for batch normalization is to add one layer 
and this is one of the predetermined or predefined keras layers and that is called batch normalization you just need to put it in between two layers where you want it to be so i can also put it here after the second hidden layer and now my network has batch normalization but as i said if you need to normalize your data and if you're doing it manually you can exchange that uh, to use instead batch normalization. And how you're going to do that is basically before you feed the data into the hidden layers, you just need to have a batch normalization layer. So by doing this, after I flatten my input, I am putting it through batch normalization. So the values that are going to be fed to the first dense layer are going to be normalized. So I do not have to do this anymore. So this is one advantage of using batch normalization, everything in one place. You don't have to worry about manually normalizing uh, separately. There is one other detail that you should pay attention to while you're implementing batch normalization, and that is deciding to put batch normalization before or after an activation function. The authors of the original batch normalization paper spoke favorably about this technique of using batch normalization before the activation function, but this is something that you might want to try out and decide for yourself if it works for your specific system and specific problem. But I'll show you how to do that if you wanted to. So basically, when you have a dense layer, the activation function is already included in here. We specify that it needs to be the really activation function. But if you wanted to, you can have your activation function as a separate layer. So if I did this, that means then whatever was outputted from the batch normalization layer will be fed, fed through an activation function then I would not need to have an activation function anymore in this layer. And I can do that for the second hidden layer too. Then I would be taking the output of a layer through batch normalization first and then through activation. And this is something that people argue that can work and might be better for your network. Um, but there is one other detail that we should look into here and that is to usage of bias. So if you remember, what happens in a dense or uh, layer or a hidden layer is that we get some sort of input from the previous layer, right? Let's call it X and we have our weights. So we multiply the input with the weights and then we add a bias to it. So when we have an activation function also already built in, what we do is we put these values through an activation function, and that is the output of our dense layer. So if we strip the activation function out of this, that means what is going to be fed to the batch normalization layer is going to be the this value. Is going to be this value. But what do we what do we do with batch normalization? We normalize the values and then we scale them and then we offset them. If you remember, and offsetting is basically the same as bias. You just add one value to it. So at the end, you do not really need your biases anymore. You can just train the offset values to uh, find its optimal value inside your neural network rather than all having a bias and an offset. So that kind of like helps you have a lower amount of parameters and also helps you train your network a tad faster. So then all you have to do is inside your dense layer, you just say use bias false because you don't want to use any bias here. But that's it when it comes to implementing batch normalization. It's very simple. It's just one extra layer that you can add if you're using Keras to build your network. Uh, just realize that you can use it as a normalization layer without the separate manual normalization that you need to do. And also make sure that you decide if you want to use it before or after the activation function of your layers. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked this video, don't forget to give us a like and maybe even subscribe because we're going to be here every single week. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to see that in the comment section also. If you'd like to integrate speech-to-text capabilities to your own projects, you can go grab the free API token from Assembly AI using the link in the description. But for now, have a nice day and I'll see you around.